Okay, let's get started. All right, lecture 11 is on defining databases and adding data to databases. So basically, we're going to be creating new databases for the first time, which is kind of exciting. Before doing that, a few announcements. Uh, homework 4 is due on Monday, and also the exams uh, grades have been um, were released recently, and the exam grades were quite high. Median was 95. Um, students have asked me worriedly, am I going to curve down? And I said no. Um, so that's good news, I guess. Um, I might, well, depending on, um, I might curve up some, some grades, uh, depending on, on how, how this distribution ends up at the end, but I'm not going to know until the class is over. But, you know, if you're, if you're kind of at the bottom and you're not sure whether you should stay in the class, just uh, stop by my office hours or uh, tomorrow, um, and we can talk about that. Any questions about grades or the exam? Okay. So this is, I like these cumulative distribu distribution plots are useful because you can see not just what the shape of the di distribution is, but what the um, like derivative of it is by the slope of this line. So anyway, not important. All right, um, bef uh, first thing I want to do is actually talk a little bit more about uh, schema design and uh, particularly composite keys because I think that has been confusing for some people and this kind of sort of relates to the homework but not totally. So here's a, uh, a database for a movie theater and uh, like a movie theater chain, I guess, because there can be many different theaters. And each theater has some screens, and there's some movies that are shown on those screens. So this shown table is a, it creates a many-to-many -many relationship between movies and screens, because uh, yeah, a, a given sc a given screen is identified by uh, the theater and the screen number, and for that combination. At a given time, there can be a particular movie playing. But that movie can be repeated on different screens at different times. Um, yeah. So the, the kind of somewhat weird thing about this design is that there are a lot of composite primary keys. Like, for example, the screens are identified by the screen number and theater, I theater ID. Screen number is like just one, two, three, four. It, so every theater has a screen one. And they probably all have a screen too, but right, the combination of theater ID and screen number is unique, right? Because within a theater, the screen number doesn't repeat. So you have to use those two columns together to uniquely identify a screen. That means that when you refer to it from elsewhere, you need both of those things. So for the showing of a movie, you need the theater ID and the screen number, and those and those kind of point. You can either use two arrows, or you might also use like one arrow that has a um, like a curly brace to uh, you know, something like this you know, to indicate that there are like two rows involved. Anyway, um, this design is okay, it works. And same thing for movies. If we wanted to allow the same name of a movie to repeat, like for remakes and stuff, you might want to combine both the movie name and the year to make a, a unique key. That itself is not an ideal strategy either because you could potentially have the same name repeat on different years. But again, if you decide to use this approach, then when you refer to it, like in the showing table, you have to use both of those uh, columns, right, to, to, to identify the movie. OK. So uh, primary keys uniquely identify rows and are used as indexes to find the row of interest. Uh, if, if you're using a composite uh, primary key, you need two rows to find the row of interest and duplication is checked across the values of two rows. So um, I just kind of said all this about composite keys. Um, but those composite keys, composite primary keys make foreign keys and parent-child relationships kind of messy because you have um, more than one column involved. So actually, you could take this design I showed you on the left and make it simpler, I don't know if simpler is the right word, but it's, it's simpler in some ways, by adding a screen ID and a movie ID to those uh, tables on the right. 
So it's more complicated because you have an additional column, but then the relationships are simpler because you only have one. You only need one column in the showing table. Uh, the showing table can become simpler and just have screen ID and movie ID to refer to a screen and a movie. Okay, so uh, your uh, relationship table here becomes smaller, and the joins that you write are simpler because you have to. Your on condition for this left design would have two different columns that have to match instead of just one. Um, and if you want to still retain the constraint that a given, for example, a given theater doesn't repeat screen numbers, you can still do that after you introduce the screen ID by adding a unique key, like a, a secondary key, essentially, a secondary primary key, kind of a uh, unique key on those two uh, columns. And same thing for the movie table. If you want to require that the name and year combination are unique, we no longer have those as a primary key, but we can make them a unique key. And additionally, okay. All right. Yeah. So th this is, this example is a is a common case where if you have a a table that's apparent, like for example, movie is apparent at the showing table. If you're going to have foreign keys refer to this, it's convenient to be able to do that reference using one column instead of two columns. And so that's what we did there, and that, that's pretty commonly found. Uh, so the movie ID is kind of a meaningless uh, column, but we added it to the data set because we wanted to be able to quickly and conveniently refer to movies. Okay. Uh, and yeah. All right. So unique keys are another thing that we, we, we introduced but didn't, haven't talked too much about. So I want I want to review that a little bit here, but um, these are needed when you want to add additional constraints apart from just those enforced by the primary keys. So the primary key uh, prevents rows from having duplicate values for those for those particular columns, but it might be that you have multiple different things that you don't want to repeat. In which case, you need not just a primary key but additional unique keys. So um, I believe we talked about uh, the music festival example a couple weeks ago where um, we had, for performances, we had uh, the primary key was the time and the artist combination. So an artist cannot play two stages at the same time. Um, but there's an additional constraint we wanted to enforce. The stage cannot host two artists at the same time. And you need, an ad you need a, a different constraint to enforce that. So you can make a unique key with the combination of time and stage to do that. So time and artist has to be unique, and time and stage has to be unique. So they, they both operate at the same time. So time and artist, if, you have, if you're considering different possibilities for filling this table, this table has the artist, the stage, and the time. Uh, when considering the combination of artist and time, if those have to be unique, then that prevents uh, time and artist. I think I may have messed this up. Yeah, but the time is different for those t uh, for those two. The second one and the third. Oh, these two conflict. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know why I was I was just focusing on the first one for some reason. Whew, okay, long day. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. The uh right, so Beyoncé is are, is on stage 2 at time 2. Cannot also she cannot also be on stage 1 at time 2. And so, in other words, this uh two this Beyoncé 2 thing can only appear once. It can't appear again with a different value for the stage. So that's why this time and artist uh combination prevents the same artist from being on, on two stages at the same time. Same thing, you can apply it to a different artist. Okay, so uh, 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 Bieber on at time one is on stage two, 
that means that he cannot also be on stage one at time one because, again, artist and time, this, this combination here can't be repeated uh, with a different value for, for, for the stage. Yeah, question? She can be. Well, it's crossed out. It's yeah. So, I think I was confused when I was looking at it for the same reason. It's crossed out not because of a conflict here, but because of a conflict here between the second and third row. So the problem is not that she's on the same stage twice at uh, two times. The problem is that that second time we already said that she's on a different stage at time two. So we can't also put her on time. That's the the point of this constraint is to prevent. Uh, an artist from being at, on two stages at the same time. Yeah. But then we also might want to impose a, an additional constraint for uh, enforcing that two artists are not using the same stage at the same time. And and that previous constraint doesn't really uh, prevent that. So if we if we look at stage and time, so every stage in time has to have just one artist associated with it. If we try to repeat the stage in time, um, like down here, the ones that are crossed out are trying to repeat previously defined values for those that pair. So we already said that stage one time two had Beyonce, so we cannot then later say that the same stage and time combination has Bieber or, or anything else. Um, this one, the last row repeats the first row, and the uh, fourth row repeats the third row. Got it. So we can these these two different constraints together rule out um, three rows and just leave us with the first, second, and uh, fifth ones as being valid of of the set. Um, it's not enough to use a single key, a single column as a key if we, if the things are interested in our um, preventing artists from sharing a stage or preventing artists from being two places at once because yeah, any one of those wouldn't work. If we try to choose the artist as a key, then that would prevent an artist from performing twice, even at different times or on different, uh, yeah, even at different times. If we made the stage a key, that would allow only one entry for a stage, so a stage could only be used once, so it couldn't be used at two different times. If we made time a key, then that would prevent um, two artists that, that would allow only one thing to happen at that time. In other words, one, only one artist can be performing at that time, even though we have multiple stages available for performances. So that the, all of those things would be, uh, you know, too restrictive for this particular design domain. All right. All right, so that aside, uh, let's move ahead to introducing some new SQL not for doing queries, but for modifying databases, creating new databases, adding data to them, removing data, stuff like that. And um, these will be useful for the project, um, which will require that you create a database. All right, so we want to be able to define tables, add rows to those tables, and then delete rows from the tables if, if things change or if we made a mistake. Also to update columns uh, in rows that are in tables. And we also want to be able to change the schema, probably. Uh, it would be helpful if we could change the schema so that we don't necessarily have to get everything right the first time and the data model can evolve over time. So we can add or remove columns, indexes, foreign keys, stuff like that. You might start off with two tables and later add a third and a fourth table and then uh, add foreign keys to link those. That's all um, quite common. And to do those things, we have uh, commands like create table, insert into, delete from, update, alter table. So these are all alternatives to the select we've been using. We've been doing everything with select, but that's just one query. It's an important query, especially for you know analysts who are mainly just looking at existing data. But if you want to move past that simple observation and into uh, analyses that involve like pulling in data from different sources and creating uh, uh, creating a, data a database to do to answer questions that um, like I say, yeah, pulls in data from from other sources, doesn't rely on existing databases. Then you'll have to um, be able to use these these uh, commands. Okay, I'm going to be showing the SQL Lite dialect of of SQL for some of these queries. Um, there, like I said before at the beginning of class, there are some variations, slight variations between the different 
um, SQL database management systems, for the most part, they're about the same. But there are cases when you might need to look up the particular syntax, and of course, there's documentation online as well as you know if you Google uh, what you're trying to do, you'll probably find uh, answers. All right, so the first thing we can do, the simplest thing, I guess, uh, in modifying data is to just delete rows. Uh, and so there's a delete command that works basically like select, um, except it's it's somewhat limited. You can't do like grouping and joins and things like that. If you but if you think of a single a simple select query that gets rows from a table and applies a filter, you can change that to be a delete that that removes those particular rows. So for example. Um, delete from classes where classroom ID equals 12. And notice we're not, we don't have to specify like what columns we're deleting because data exists as entire rows. And so you, you're del you, you delete at the level of rows. Um, yeah, so this is deleting all the classes that were in classroom 12, right? You should be careful when you're deleting to make sure you include a where clause, because if you write a simple command like delete from classes that has no uh, where clause, that would actually delete all the rows in the table, which is usually not what you want to do. Um, so what you, what you often will, will do is run a select that prints out all the rows that you plan to delete, and then look at it to make sure that looks correct, and then you can modify that by changing the select star into delete, and then run that. Right? Questions about deletions? Yeah, it's relatively straightforward. However, there are some cases when you might try to delete and you'll find that you can't do that because foreign keys um, are, are cr have created relationships between the tables and the row you're trying to delete is actually referred to elsewhere and doing the deletion would make that other data invalid. So it, what exactly happens uh, would depend on how the foreign keys were defined the default behavior is is to restrict the deletion. So, for example, if you try to delete a classroom, and there are some classes that refer that are in that classroom, then uh, the restrict um, behavior for that foreign key between classrooms, uh, between classes and classrooms, would uh, that restrict would prevent the deletion of the classroom until you delete all the rows that refer to it. That's kind of the safest behavior. There's also a behavior that's ex the exact opposite, which is cascade, which is very unsafe. So if you, but if you, if you delete a row that's referred to by other rows, it just deletes those other rows too. So you might delete one row and that ends up deleting thousands or, or millions of rows if there just happen to be thousands of rows referring to it, either directly or indirectly, because um, it could cascade to multiple tables. So for example, um, yeah, well, if you, Delete in the in the school scheduling database. You might delete a staff member, and that staff if 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 the foreign keys are set to cascade, that could end up deleting a lot of some grades, because that staff member was teaching a class that was attended by students, and those students have grades for those classes. But all those things are like linked together through foreign keys, and the uh, the grade might no longer make sense after the staff member that assigned the grade was deleted. So in that case, uh, cascade might be a reasonable, either cascade or restrict would be policies that would prevent um, that kind of inconsistency where you have data that no longer refers to anything valid. So restrict prevents the deletion, cascade allows the deletion to proceed, but it then also removes anything else that refers to it. The third option, which is kind of weird, uh, set null, allows you to delete a row, but if any any child rows refer to it, then those references get changed to null values, um, which, depending on what, what you're trying to accomplish, might be appropriate. But, um, yeah, question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me, let me show an example. So let's bring up a database. Uh, not a new one. Um, let's open up the school scheduling. So it, school scheduling has these tables. Let's say we want to delete a faculty member. Or, uh, yeah. So 
we'll, we'll look at it first. Select star from faculty. Just to see who's available. Okay. Then we were going to delete from faculty where staff ID is 98005. So I'm going to try to delete one of the uh, faculty members. When I do that, it says foreign key constraint failed because um, I'm trying to bring up the diagram. Yeah. In this, in the diagram for the uh, the data model, faculty is here, and that there, there are faculty classes that have staff ID, that staff ID. And if I tried, if I, when I tried to delete this, that would make those faculty class rows like invalid because they have um, there's a foreign key staff ID here that refers to the to, to that row. Um, and the restrict, so that every foreign key has one of three policies, either restrict, cascade, or set null. The restrict policy prevents the deletion if it would invalidate foreign keys that point to it. And the, the alternative is cascade. The main alternative is cascade, which would then actually delete everything that refers to it. And then the third alternative, set null, um, would cause, for example, if there was a faculty class, that class would just have a null staff member. So we'd still keep the class, we'd keep like all the grades that were associated with the class uh, and the student enrollments associated with the class, but if we tried to do a join to figure out who taught the class, we wouldn't know because that faculty member was removed. There would be an, a null in this faculty classes, uh, in the row in the faculty classes table that referred to the, uh, that particular class. Yes? I didn't make this database, to be clear, but I assume that they, that they used restrict because that was the default. Um, and if you're curious, yeah, the authors of the book that was optional actually provide, made these databases. Um, if we go back to DB Browser, you can actually look at how the... Um, foreign keys are defined. So faculty classes is that linking table, that relationship table that says who taught each class. And if you click on modify table, so it shows here the um, code that was used to generate the, there's like a, this, this particular tool, DB Browser for SQLite, has some graphical ways to like view what's in the table and delete it and modify, sorry, the, the column properties, but it also shows you like the basic SQL code that would, that tells you like what the definition of the tables. We haven't, I'll, in a few slides I'll show what the syntax is. Um, uh, the question kind of uh, pushed ahead a, a bit, but you can see that there's a foreign key here, a staff ID that refers to the faculty table staff ID. And it doesn't say anything afterwards. It could, it might say, um, it's so, so that tells me that it's using the default behavior, whereas if it was, um, you can also say, um, like, on delete cascade, that's an option. And you'd see that uh, that would, that it, when defining the table, you would have had to say, that, put this little phrase in here to change from the default behavior to the cascade behavior. You'd say on delete restrict. Right, so yes, it's it's a default thing that you don't have to put in there. Just like inner join is the default type of join. Yeah. And then right, you can say also say on delete set null. That would be uh, the the third non default thing. I'm gonna cancel that. Okay. So that is, that's, a, that's how foreign keys affect deletions. Okay. Questions about that? Yeah. It's permanent to the file. Yeah. Well, it's permanent. I believe it's permanent to the file. Yeah. So you, you'll notice that um, 
There's no like save button. You can you can open a database, but you can't really save a database because it automatically saves. Like it it always um, the way this that this the SQL Lite databases work is that there always needs to be a copy of the data on disk in order for you to access it. So every t every t anytime you do anything here, like if you were to just um, uh, major something like that. Unfortunately, it, it's like every time I do something, there's a foreign key constraint failure because things are interconnected. But I could probably if I if I look carefully, I could see um, certain things are can be deleted, like um, student schedules, for example. I could unenroll a student from a class by deleting a row. So let, let's try to do that. Um, select star from student schedules. This is, these are all the enrollments. And let's, let's narrow it down by saying, let's only look at the enrollments where the grade was 70. OK, so, so there's one enrollment where the student got a, a grade of 70. I can actually now delete this enrollment by just changing the select star to delete. So it's going to delete the row from that table that matches that criterion. And that worked. So you see how it, it, it said took zero second, milliseconds, one row affected. And now um, when I select star from student schedules where grade equals 70, I get no results. And that actually. I think that saved the file. That saved to the file immediately. So what, now I have to go to the website and re-download the file. <laughs> um, yeah. I believe. I mean, it says write changes and revert. I mean, I think maybe it might be doing something clever where it keeps a copy. OK. Yeah, actually, I take that back. So. See, so this DB browser does seem to like make a shadow copy of the file and allow you to write changes and revert changes. But in general, with SQLite, whenever you operate on it, it um, it modifies the file directly. Like the way you you would normally well maybe normals is not a, a useful term uh, useful concept here. But another way, let's say, to access SQLite. Is to use the command line, All right? Uh, SQLite three, and you can like open up a file here. Uh, okay, so I have a bunch of files here. If I run SQLite, this is available like both on on Macs. They, this comes installed by default, but you can also download it for Windows. If I want to open like sales orders, I, I can like do all these things I did, did before in the command line. Like for example, let me put this a little higher so it's, just so it's easier to read. Select um, star from customers. So this this does queries without all the fancy graphical stuff that you have in db browser and it's it's faster but it provides fewer like helpful tools and like you can't and the, like browsing abilities and things like that so if if for example in the project if you end up working on a uh, data set that has millions of rows or tens of millions of rows or even hundreds of thousands which i would encourage you to do that if you can um, you might find that you have to work on the command line here instead of using DB Browser because DB Browser is like it, it is a it's not it doesn't work so well with um with lots of rows because it, it like provide pr tries to provide a nice graphical interface almost like Excel for working with data that could get quite large and the whole point of a database is to is to allow you to work with large data anyway but that was a digression. Um, Did I, was I trying to sh prove some, like how did I even get there? <laughs> oh, who cares? <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> All right. So foreign keys. We can delete things. Sometimes we can't because um, there's a constraint that prevents us from doing that. Okay. I did eventually want to show you that command line thing, and we'll, we'll probably come back to it later. 
All right, so in addition to deleting, so deleting is the simplest kind of modification we can make because uh, all we have to do is create a filter that specifies what the rows are. We also can change a row uh, by changing the values of different columns. So for example, uh, here we can update department set department name equals social studies where department name equals history. Right, it's pretty simple. It, this looks a lot like a select query in the sense that it has oh, a filter, but it has this set thing, uh, set keyword that says afterwards what the changes you're going to make that applies to all the rows that match this filter. And the, and the first thing you specify is the, the, um, is the table you're working on. Okay. Yeah. Um, Will this cascade? It's a. It's tr so normally you would use this to modify columns that are not, um, that are not keys, and and that are um, not referred to from elsewhere. But I guess you could. So th so it's true that this this could be a this could be affected by your foreign key constraints. Like if you tried to change. So this, this diagram shows that like faculty classes uses a staff ID to refer to faculty. If you tried to change a staff ID for a person and that staff ID is used elsewhere in a foreign key, that would um, that could cause a problem. Like it, your ability to change it would be affected by the same uh, rules uh, for the foreign key. So if you if it was restricted, then you wouldn't be able to make the change because of the foreign key constraint. If cascade was enabled, then you might actually end up deleting things in other tables because you changed a value in one table, uh, or set null would would, would um, clear out the values in the old, in the other table that no longer match what you're changing. Yeah. All right. Um, so one of these command one of these commands can update as many rows as the filter matches. And you can also use subqueries to, um, to, to build these. So for example, you can update students, set the student major equal to some number, but you don't know exactly what that number is. You can do a subquery to find the major ID corresponding to the major that has uh, English as the uh, name. Right? So this would be a, a way to use a subquery to set uh, all this. This actually would set all the students major to be the ID of English, because there's no filter in this update to just uh, apply it to certain rows. It applies to all the rows. Okay. Um, right. And we can use, uh, in the set part of the update, we can refer to column values. Like, for example, if we did update student schedules set grade equals grade plus 5, where class ID equals 1500, this would look at all this, the enrollments for that class and change the grade to be five greater than what the grade was before. So it would like add five points to all the grades, for example. Um, and the exact value it ended up being would be different for each row, depending on what the old value was for that row, of course. Okay. All right. We can also up update multiple values at the same time by just putting commas between them. So like if we're updating this table, my table, set column 1 equals value 1, column 2 equals value 2, column 3 equals value 3. Um, that's pretty straightforward. These could be constants or, or it could be formulas based on other columns or whatever. And that brings us to inserting new rows, which is similar to updating rows, except you have to specify values for, like, all, for all the columns. So there's an insert command, insert into uh, table name, and then values, and you list out all the values. So this, would ju this just creates a row with these five values for the five columns in this buildings table. This particular form requires you to like spell out the values for, uh, list the values for all the columns. Uh, that's, you don't always want to have to do that. Um, so you can actually use a variation that lists out the particular columns that you want to set. So in this case, uh, it's listing out building name, building code, number of floors, elevator access, site parking available. And then it's listing out the corresponding values. And you can use that to, like, ch ch if you don't remember what the order, if you want to specify the order, change the order of the um, values you're setting, you could 
you could list the building code first, like FD, and then building name afterwards. Or you can leave out certain columns if those columns are optional or if they have some default value that they, that they take when they're not specified. Um, we'll, get, we'll come back to that when we talk about how tables are defined. Okay. All right. So another, another thing that you uh, will, will do is uh, bulk load data from files or bulk load data in general. So, I mean, these commands I showed you are like ways to write a query to insert one row of data. That's not super useful because you don't want to have to write out, like this, if you have a big database, there'd be a lot of code that you'd have to write to fill in every single row. Okay, so in practice, you want, you want ways to do this in a more automated way, right? And three basic uh, approaches for that. The first is to write a, a program or a script that programmatically inserts data by building these queries programmatically. Uh, so for example, if you could write an R or a Python program that had, that had access to some data source or some program or had, had some code that generated data, let's say, and whenever it found a new data uh, point, uh, it would generate a query to insert the data and it would you know, programmatically run that query on the database or it would build out a really long query that had a bunch of entries, one for each row, and it built these th this long string kind of pro programmatically right, by, by doing like string operations. Um, that's that's common, right? And like real uh, software services, like if you go to, I don't know, like eBay or just some website that has a database behind it that, that stores all the data, whenever you do something like create a new listing, somehow the code for that website, uh, when it, it gets the inputs you provide to the um, web server, it, it translates those into a bunch of SQL commands like this to add new elements to the database. And later on, uh, when you ask for a web page, it, it generates programmatically, it generates the proper queries to get the appropriate data to render the page that it wants to render to you. Right? So higher level um, programming languages are often used to generate SQL queries to get data from, from databases. So even if uh, yeah, a lot of real systems use a combination of SQL and other languages. That's definitely true. Another strategy for loading in lots of data is to uh, get that data in a CSV file. A CSV is a very simple spreadsheet format. It's, CSV stands for Comma Separated Values. And it's like a text file that has um, one line for each row and all the columns are separated by commas. So you have like, a, you may have a number, then comma, then another number, or maybe a string, comma, something else. Um, and that, that, that would be like four different columns. And with, with SQLite and other um, database management systems, there are tools to import these CSV files. And I'll, I'll show in a second how that works with DB Browser. A uh, third possibility here, there actually are software packages called ETL. Uh, Many di from many different manu uh, vendors that um, allow you to like create scripts essentially f for transforming, getting data from one place and loading it into a database or pulling data out of one database and putting it into another database. Uh, because this is just a common thing to do, um, th these kinds of software packages exist that are configurable in different ways. But we're not gonna really uh, talk about that very much. Okay. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna come back to this whole idea of using a CSV file in a couple slides. Before we do that, I want to show first uh, how. Well, okay, actually, let me let me show something. Uh, show, show a quick demo of something, then we'll come back to the slides. So, how to import a CSV file? If you're with this particular program, you can create a new database. And just give it a give it a, a name, say temp. Okay, so I have a new database now. It, it asks me to define a table. I'm going to ignore that, and I can go to File Imports, and there are two options: database from SQL file, and there's another option: table from CSV file. So if we just choose that, Oop, I clicked the wrong one. Uh, import CSV file. And let's find a CSV file. I happen to have downloaded one somewhere. 
yeah. So this particular file is from another st uh, student's project from a previous uh, quarter. How do I get that in there? One second. Okay. So this data actually came from Kaggle, which is a a website that has it's like a data science repository. Um, so people post different data sources, uh, different data sets that are that are open. And this particular one is a uh, LA County Restaurant Inspections and Violations. And there there are two files. One of them is inspections, one of them is violations. If we just focus on the inspections file, so a lot of the data on this website is provided as CSV files, just because it's like the simplest possible format you can use. And you know, whether you're using Python or R or something else or SQL, uh, you can deal with it. Okay? Or if you're just using Excel, you can open it up in Excel. Although this file is so big that if you tried to open it in Excel, it would not really work very well. It would kind of sort of work, but not very well. Okay. Anyway, so it, it gives you a little preview of what the data looks like by showing the first few dozen rows. But basically, see, every, every, ro every row corresponds to an inspection. So someone went to a restaurant and gave it a grade for the, like a health grade, basically. Um, and it has information about the restaurant and about the inspector and things like that, right? So uh, coming back to the database program here, DB Browser, um, when you do an import here, it actually has a nice little wizard thing that lets you preview it and, and, play, and change the parameters of the import. But just using the default settings here, let me give it a, a table name that doesn't have spaces. I'm going to call it violations. And when I import, I just hit OK. It takes a little time because there's a lot of entries. And you'll see now I have a database with uh, 272,000 uh, entries, so quite large. Now, this is not actually, the, when the student was doing this project, they didn't just want to stop here with a table that had all these uh, entries because uh, the, the uh, this schema kind of this database I'm sorry this data needs to be denormalized like there's a lot there are a lot of repeated entries like the same restaurants are uh, reviewed many times and the same inspectors uh, appear many times like they're only 39,000 unique addresses out of the 200,000. And there are only 248 employee IDs. So you you would probably want to somehow split this up into several tables instead of having these rows that repeat values um, for like every time you have a different inspection for the same restaurant, you know. This has this is one table. There's one big table. So you a CSV file is a data file format for a table, for a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet is one table. Okay, there, there's inspections, there isn't a second one violation. So there are two tables, essentially. But even within those two, within, within the first one especially, there's a lot of, uh, it's denormalized data, there's a lot of repetition, it's not the most efficient way to represent that data, and the, the structure doesn't really represent the, the relationships between the different like objects and, and parties involved, okay. But I was able to I was able to import the data. We'll see that that's just a starting point, because like later on I can I can do queries from this temporary table to generate the normalized tables that have just the unique values that I'm interested in. So we'll come back to that in a in a few minutes. But let me go back to the slides just to so okay I sort of show to you that you can import a CSV file pretty easily. If you had a really huge file, you might need to do it on the command line. And that, that would be pretty easy too. There's just like a certain syntax you need to type in, and it'll um, it'll lo load it, load the file into a new table. Uh, yeah, okay. So, but that that's that, that's a way to create a table, a very simple table based on a file. But in general, if for a, a database that to be more useful, we want to have more control over how 
over what's in each table. Like specifically, what are the table names? Uh, what, are the, what are the column names? What types do each column have? Like integer, floating point, remember that's like a decimal type number, text, dates, and so on. Um, we can specify whether columns are optional or required. And then we can define the keys. Like, in other words, all the things that you've been doing with those drawings to define, you've been making drawings to define new databases. Uh, but to translate those drawings into an actual implementation, you need to use uh, the create table commands. So you define columns, keys, and indexes, and so forth. All right. So the, the syntax for that looks something like this. Or here's an, here's an example of that syntax uh, where we're creating a table called buildings. So this picture on the upper right is a piece of a schema, uh, one of the ones we've been using from the school scheduling example. And this is the code that would generate this table. So it has has five columns here, and the names are listed, the types are listed in, in um, green. It's not, uh, we'll talk later on, I think, a little bit about different types. It's not too important, but nvarchar is like variable number of characters up to a certain size. This is text, two different text columns. And an integer, this is small integer uh, field, bits are just zeros or, or ones. And in addition to the column names and types, you also have some of these columns have additional information, like the elevator access uh, column cannot be null, and the default value is zero. So that means when you add new rows, you don't necessarily have to indicate what the elevator access value is, because it'll assume that it's zero if you don't provide it. And um, same thing for site parking available. There's a default value but it can't be null. Whereas these other ones actually can be null um, according to this definition. And at the very bottom, there's a, a line that says what the primary key is for the table building code. Okay. So this is a translation of all the information we see in this uh, little picture can be translated into this code. And actually this has some additional information apart from what's in the picture, like the types in green and this extra stuff uh, about the whether it can be null and what the default values are. So we can, do, we can do the same thing for a more complex table, like the subjects table in the school scheduling example. It doesn't just have columns and keys, but it also has um, uh, foreign keys. So like some, some of these values refer to other tables. So for example, the category ID, the second column in this table, this refers to rows in this categories table. So every subject is a certain category, like um, you know, data management would be in the computer science category, for example. So in defining that row, we have an, some additional bit of code that says that this column references the categories table and its category ID column in that table. And so that this defines a foreign key. There's a second foreign key for the um, subject prereq. This prereq column, it can be null if it, uh, it defaults to null, in fact. But if it's set, it has to refer to the subject's table and the subject code column. So in other words, the, the position of these, these arrows are, um, or these lines in this case, which I usually draw as arrows, are represented by these references uh, definitions for foreign keys. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you you put a comma between and that that works, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is kind of a weird design, but the subject ID is a number, like a sort of a randomly generated number, and then subject I cat uh sorry, subject code is something that's a little bit more human readable. So I think that um in this example, like you know, C S three seventeen would be the subject code, but the subject ID might be like 435, like something that the registrar only knows, you know. Um, but both of those are unique. So it, technically, in this particular case, I'm, you know, they, they probably could have eliminated the subject ID and just had a subject code that was the primary key, because both of them are unique. But for whatever reason, they decided that you know maybe this, the subject ID is shorter or or whatever. They're the business that the real life situation they're modeling just happens someone at some point decided that they're going to have two different things that are unique and they wanted to make sure they could represent that in the database yeah 
Okay. So uh, you can look up the syntax for the create table command online, and you know there'll be diagrams like I showed you for select earlier on. Uh, except you know you'll find that some of these you have to look at these square boxes refer to other pictures. Like for example, the column definition in this high-level picture, the column definition just has one box, but that actually can be expanded to the details that show that the column definition includes column name and a type name optionally, and then also column constraints that can be repeated so that um, the diagrams can, there's kind of like a whole, you can cross-reference them to a lot of different uh, pictures. Yeah. And so on. Yeah. All right, so if you know Python, then you'll find so I personally I like using Python for little, uh, well not just little, but for, for projects that involve data manipulation if you know plain SQL is not enough. And you'll find that there is a whole package dedicated to SQLite available uh, in the standard Python library. So you, don't, you do not even have to like pip install anything. It's just available as SQLite 3. And the uh, the documentation shows how you can, like, with very little code, just import this package and then connect to a database file. So this is like similar to the files we've been using in class, and then create cursors, which is kind of like a Python concept for working with databases. Um, but you can follow the example. You can base your if you do this on your own, you can base it on these examples, and you'll find that you can just basically put in uh, SQL code inside of functions uh, in Python that, that runs that code and returns the value back to Python. Um, and the same exact thing applies in basically any other language, including R or whatever you're, you're most familiar with, C++, um, and so on. Yeah. Um, so why, why would you use Python? I guess that the point of using a, a higher level language in addition to SQL is that it just allows you to do do more. And depending on what you need to do, you may or may not need it. So um, for example, if you are getting, like scraping data off the web and you want to put that in a database, okay? Like the web scraping part is a Python thing. There's no way you're gonna do that in SQL. So you have some code that like finds the data somehow. And then you have this data, now what do you do with it? Maybe you want to put it in a SQL database so you can do queries, right? So that's an example of using Python. Um, it could be that you have some f data files that are not as like pretty as the, SQL, as the CSV files. Um, like if you have JSON or XML files, we'll talk a little bit about those later on in the class. Those are other data file formats that um, are not n necessarily tabular to begin with. So it doesn't make, there's no easy way to just like with one click stick it into a database like you can sort of do with CSVs. So in that case, you'd need to somehow have code that like in figures out where from the file to pull out the data you need and how to transform that into a tabular representation. That would be Python code. Um, it could also be that you have SQL data, uh, you have a, a SQL database and you want to do an analysis, but there just is not SQL syntax that you can find that like gets done what you want to do. And so you give up on just writing a SQL query and decide, but you think, oh, I can do this in like a few lines of Python or maybe like 100 or 200 lines of Python. It might be quite complicated. Like I want to find, um, I want to figure out, uh, I don't know, like, you know, I've, I always ask you these questions, like, how, like write a query to do this. S like there are questions I can ask that you really can't <laughs> answer with SQL. And some of those you can answer in, 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 in Python um, by just doing a, a writing code that does a, a sequence of SQL commands and also does other, has other code that does things in between and is able to like link together those, uh, those queries to eventually get the answer you need. Um, what else? But yeah, the sky's the limit once you include, once you connect SQL to a uh, general purpose programming language. The reverse question you might want to ask is, okay, now that I'm using like Python or R, why do I need, want to either bo even bother using SQL? Right, so like what's the benefit, like why, why do we have two things there, not s just one? Like why didn't we just say, okay, we couldn't do it with SQL, now we're gonna do it with Python? 
Well, the answer to that is that, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning of class, um, a database is really useful because it allows you to store things permanently. I mean, it's true, you can, you can save things in files. You can use, like, in Python, you can use Pickle and, like, other things to, like, just store data. But it, it, um, it stores it permanently, but in a way that's, like, efficient and has indexes and allows you to, to find things quickly. So if, if in Python or, like, whatever language you're working in, for you to work with, say, like, a terabyte of data or a, 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 even just, like, a gigabyte or 100 megabytes of data in an efficient way and, like, quickly find things you're looking for and, like, join different pieces of data... Uh, to do that efficiently, like working from scratch with just like basic Python, like dictionaries and lists and things, like you'd have, you'd it would be a whole big data um, structures project. You'd have to write lots of code to build like trees and like and figure out how you're going to use the, the have the keys uh, work and whatnot. So uh, basically, the database is like just, just okay. So if if you know Python or R or whatever. All those languages have basic things like lists and dictionaries and sets. Those are great. The database is kind of like something much more complicated than one of those things that has that's a lot more powerful. That, that's the way I would put it. And it's not quite native to the language like dictionaries and lists are, but it's pretty close. Like they, 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 there are plugins that are built in to let you access the SQL uh, database. Okay, so um, let's come back to the idea of doing a, a real-world world project where you have some data source, some data file that you want to work with, um, some CSV file, let's say, those uh, health inspections from LA. Uh, you want to work with that data, but you, you know that it has some, there's some problems in the data, um, it's, it's redundant, and you think that there might be like bogus entries and some like repetitions maybe, or, or invalid entries in some of the columns. So in a lot of cases, to, to do that preliminary work of like analyzing the raw data source before com generating your final data set, it's very common to import your data into a temporary table using the steps I just showed, like just that simple import of the file to create a table. Once you do that, you can actually start doing an analysis, like a preliminary analysis or exploratory analysis of essentially of that data file that CSV file, except it's a, it's a copy of the CSV file that's been pulled into a table using SQL. Okay, so we might eventually want to make a database table for people, like this person table has um, social security number, first name, last name, birth date, um, it has the proper types, it has a primary key, but if we had a data file that we're trying to feed into here, we might not be able to do it directly because the data file might have like you know people with the same social security number, or some of the names might be too long, longer than 30 characters. Some of the birth dates might be missing, but this this schema requires that the birth dates are not null. You know, so to to so a simple import might fail. So instead, you might want to just create relax this uh, schema. Take this, make it much simpler. So, in other words, allow every, eliminate the keys, so that things can repeat if they want to. Um, change the types to be just text, because you know the CSV file is text, is a textual representation. So, although things might not be integers when you when you think they are, and the length might be longer than you expect, you know that they're going to be. It's going to be text. Um, and do the import into that, and then run queries on that temporary table to uh, eventually generate the final table. So, yes. So, for example, if you have a temporary table with, with, in this case, orders, you can write a query that inserts into the final table orders in certain columns by doing a query into the temporary table to generate the values that you need. Um, so I want to show how that works with this data I imported for the uh, health inspections, I have, uh, like, let's say, one of the things you may notice here is is that there are, I, already, I said this before, but there are a lot, there's a lot of repetition. Like, we have several violations here that have the same serial number and the same date. So basically, there was, like, one inspection that led to multiple violations, yet we're repeating um, 
They have different descriptions and codes, but they're the same location. Um, so like here's it's the same restaurant. Right, so we might want to eventually, we want to come up with a, a, a design uh, that splits us up into like three tables, for example. I'm not sure if that's exactly the right number, but let's just start there with that assumption. Okay, so we might want to have like the restaurants here at some table there. We might want to have an inspection and violations here. Right, so the, the inspection corresponds to a restaurant ID. And it has some additional information, like maybe the time and other stuff. And the violation, actually, I think there's, I think there's a serial number, which is the, which is the primary key. And uh, the serial number here, let's say that we have a violation ID. Anyway, so we want to turn one table into many tables. And we can do that by running queries on that, that, that table that generate these subtables. Because like the data is all smushed together here, but it doesn't have to be. Like for example, if we, there's a facility name And uh, facility address. Whoops. So if we like selected uh, the facility name, facility address, facility city, facility ID from that table. And we grouped by the facility ID. You notice that took uh, four seconds, so it's a little bit slower now that we're working with a significantly s a large data set. But there are 12,000 rows instead of like 20,000. And these kind of look like they, these are all the unique facilities, right? So we could create so we could create a table for this information, and insert in, insert into it from that temporary table. The temporary table is the um, violations table that has like that big spreadsheet with all that duplicated stuff. So um, you can run a create table command to create the appropriate table. You can also use this GUI in this particular. Um, this particular program allows you to do this all graphically. I don't know why it's just saying that. But like I can put in the you can call this the facility table and it has an ID that's a primary key and a name and which is a these aren't the name is a text. There's also uh let's say address that's an integer, that's text, and uh, city. So this this code down here is, is like a what this little tool generates for generating a table with four columns where the primary key is integer ID and it also has name, address, and city. Okay. So I, and I, I went ahead and generated that. So now I have two tables in the database facility. But this facility table has no data. Violations has lots of data. Facility has no data. I spelled it wrong, of course, but let's ignore that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can fix that, I guess. Uh, facility, yeah. 
All right, so this query generated the data that I want to fill into that table. So I can uh, refer back to the slides to see, I can insert into the new table by selecting data from the old table. So uh, insert into facilities, facility, and I want to specify the columns. In this case, name, address, city, and ID. This happens to be in a different order from how I created it, but because I'm specifying the order to match how I'm selecting it, that's fine. Uh, and run it. And it says there's a data type mismatch. Yeah, data type mismatch. That's because, right, the facility ID is a string field, not a text field, not, not a number. Sorry, I defined it as a number, but it's actually text. So I could, I could actually change, I, in SQLite, you can apply a function to, to like basically I can remove those this first two letters, the F and A. Begins with the Yth character, okay. So if, if I, instead of just printing the, I, printing, uh, sorry, instead of just printing out the ID, I can print out the, uh, a substring of the facility ID that starts, that just takes, uh, proceeding, begins with the Yth character. Does that, is that your zero indexed or what? I don't know. Let's run it to see what it produces. Okay, I think I need, so I need to actually put three in here. So I, this is like a data cleaning process, I, I, right? I, I'm, I'm manipulating this data to change the facility ID to be not FA something, but to be just the number part of it. And if I, uh, now, that I now that it looks like what I want to insert, I can, I can ch paste back in the, the, the insert part to stick this data into the table and it worked and I had now have 12,000 entries in this facility table okay and the IDs are these numbers that were taken after the FA part of the facility ID right and you'll notice in this query I, I was careful, careful to group by facility ID because I know that in the rod in the original table they're repeated many times these facilities are repeated many times uh, whereas I wanted in, in the facility table to have just one copy. Uh, and the, the thing I'm grouping by is the thing that happens to be the primary key in the table I'm inserting into. So I know that those aren't going to be repeated. Okay. Sound good? So you can, you can repeat this process. You can repeat this process for uh, all these different tables and you could define you could actually define these three tables ahead of time with the foreign keys between them and then try to run queries off the original table that filled in the three tables correctly and it would turn out and the student actually had a lot of trouble with this because there are a lot of inconsistencies in this in this this data uh, so that gets to be uh, kind of a a challenge now that might, might be actually a case where python would help because you could keep track you could try to have some rules in python for dealing with inconsistencies and missing data which would be kind of might be hard to encode in SQL. Like you could, you could iterate through all the rows and have code that decides, okay, that checks things and has some rules for like changing things. Yeah, like if, if, if I find a street address that is too long, change it to null or truncate it to the right length. Or if I find that, this, that it says avenue, I want to change it to just av. Like those kinds of transformations, like that would, that would be, that could actually be done by one of these ETL tools I talked about that are, are basically software tools built f that are designed for creating rules for transforming data from one format to another, or you can also build it from scratch uh, in a general purpose language. Okay. Um, I just did this. This is a, a slide that has a link to the data set I was working on. All right. So to recap, 
uh, today we, we started off talking a little bit about uh, keys and composite primary keys and how sometimes it's helpful to introduce a new identifier column to make foreign keys uh, simpler because you, the foreign keys then only have to have one column instead of multiple columns. And we looked at that movie theater example and also the uh, uh, music festival example to see where uh, uh, how composite keys were used and also where we could replace a composite key with a uh, new numeric ID. After that, we showed a bunch of new commands for like creating new tables, adding data, removing table data, updating data. Uh, we didn't talk about alter table, but that's another one that um, can be used to change columns. And we kind of briefly showed, we at least mentioned that SQL can be used inside another language to build a database programmatically. Basically, anything you can do, and if you can type type it out <laughs> in a mechanical way, you can build a program that like figures out how to generate that SQL code for you instead of you doing it all manually. Okay. All right, so I'll see you next time. And uh, I, th I guess the, yeah, the next homework's due on Monday, and then there'll be another one um, and after that.